I'm going to talk about the next section of the class, optimal taxation. All right, so we're going to talk about four uh, sets of things. We're first going to start by talking about commodity taxation and the classic Ramsey rule, one of the most important results in optimal tax theory. Then we'll talk about capital income taxation and sp spend a particular amount of time on the retirement savings literature, which fits into, it's like an empirical analog to the type of stuff we'll talk, talk about here and is very active right now. Uh, we'll then talk about income taxes and the Murley's model and focus in particular on implementing the Murley's model empirically, uh, drawing on the work of Manuel Saez and others. And then we'll talk about optimal transfer programs like the optimal design of the EITC or uh, uh, trans other transfers, in-kind transfers to low-income people and so forth. So the way you want to think about optimal commodity taxes is that we're essentially going to combine the lessons we've learned on the incidence and efficiency costs of taxes to now s ask the normative question of what's the best tax system given some objective function, right? And what is that objective function going to embody? Typically equity and efficiency concerns, right? We're concerned about the size of the pie and we're concerned about how the pie is distributed. And we're going to build both of those in to say something about the optimal system. So from a purely efficiency uh, point of view, the problem is really simple. We would finance the government purely through lump sum taxation, right? We know that lump sum taxes don't distort prices, don't generate deadweight loss, and so we should just use lump sum taxes. But once you have redistributional concerns, this becomes much harder because ideally what you would do when you have redistributional concerns is levy individual specific lump sum taxes. So what, why do we care about redistribution? What in the Murley's model, <clears throat> it's that some people have more skills than others, okay? So some people, uh, let's say, end up in the most extreme case having a disability or end up you know, having a lower ability to uh, generate earnings than others. If I knew ex ante who those different people were, what I'd want to ideally do is just levy a head tax on each person. You know, I see like, suppose to take the example we talked about before, height is the only determinant of earnings. I would just levy a height specific income tax, right? Uh, and not condition it on wages at all. In practice, we, we don't have such good predictors of who's high ability and who's low ability. And so we end up being forced to redistribute on the basis of ex post outcomes. So you made a lot of money, you must have been high ability, I'm gonna tax you a lot. That ends up being a distortionary tax because it distorts your incentive to work hard uh, and that creates the trade-off between equity and efficiency, right? So, uh, you know, whatever outcome you're taxing, income or consumption, you're gonna end up with these distortions and so that's gonna motivate the types of policies we're gonna study. So at a high level, it's very useful to keep in mind that there are two broad approaches to optimal taxation. One is called the Ramsey tradition, which I think of as essentially restricting attention to linear tax systems. So think of T dot X type of tax systems. The, and then there's the Merleysian approach where Merley says, you know, why do we restrict ourselves to this particular tax instrument? Let's allow for nonlinear tax systems where it's T of X with no restrictions on T of X. And in particular, importantly, I'm also gonna allow lump sum taxes, right? So in the Ramsey approach, I'm gonna rule out the possibility of lump sum taxes by assumption and consider linear taxes. So I'm gonna say, there are reasons, which I'm not gonna model, that I don't wanna use lump sum taxation. So let's restrict attention to distortionary linear taxes and solve for the optimal policy. Murley says, uh, let's not make any ad hoc assumptions about what is or is not permitted in the tax system. Let's permit you to implement lump sum taxes but let's model their costs, their endogenous costs uh, in a model with heterogeneity, right? So if I impose too much lump sum taxation in the Merlesian model, that's gonna end up being undesirable because it takes too much money away from low income people relative to high income people. And so I'm gonna allow the lump sum tax and then solve for the optimal tax system uh, directly. So we'll uh, pick up there next time. And so naturally you would think you wanna tax things that are uh, more elastic less and we'll derive that optimal Ramsey tax formula uh, in this lecture. The second uh, very influential and famous set of results is due to, are due to Shamley and Judd in two separate papers, uh, which showed that it's optimal to have zero capital income taxes in the long run in infinite horizon Ramsey models. And we'll also touch upon that 
uh, in this lecture. And we'll talk about how this result has actually shaped the policy debate quite a bit because that's kind of behind the scenes and why many people think we should have low capital income tax rates relative to labor income tax rates, but has been challenged in more recent work. Uh, the third result is uh, due to Diamond and Murley's, which is a result that's called production efficiency. We will not cover that in this class, but just so you're familiar with what it is, <laughs> Uh, it's the idea that you always, no matter what your tax system is, you want to maintain efficient production. That is, you want to be on the frontier of the production possibilities uh, set. Uh, and so as an example of the kinds of things that rules out, you don't want to tax intermediate inputs is one prediction of their theorem. They show under very general conditions, no matter what tax instruments you're using, you want to produce efficiently, which kind of makes sense. Why do you introduce unnecessary distortions into the production process? when you could just tax the final goods anyway. And that's the logic of their result. Uh, and then the fourth result, which I'll briefly describe here, but you'll cover in much more detail because there's a literature surrounding it, is the Atkinson and Stiglitz result, which combines the Merlesian model of optimal progressive income taxation with the Ramsey type models we're gonna talk about here where we have linear taxes on commodities. And their result is that if you have access to a progressive income tax, you don't need to use consumption taxes at all. That is, you can achieve the uh, um, second best optimum, the best you'll ever do given the information constraints, just using the progressive income tax. Another way to state this result is that consumption taxation is superfluous. And the reason that connects, that actually connects to this Shamley and Judd result, because as we'll talk about later, you can think about taxes on savings as basically taxes on consumption goods where the two consumption goods are two different periods, right, C1 and C2. And so this result is another rationale for why you might not want to tax capital income, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So just keep in mind, at the broadest level, these are four uh, important results, and then we're gonna go into the mathematical detail of each of these things, but I don't want you to lose sight of the big picture. Okay, so we start with the Ramsey uh, tax problem, which is the simplest and classic optimal tax model. So in this model, the government sets taxes on uses of income, say consumption goods, in order to accomplish two objectives. The government wants to raise a total amount of revenue of E, which we're gonna take as exogenous. So you wanna build a bridge that costs a million dollars or something. And you want to, you're a benevolent social planner, so you wanna raise that tax in the most efficient possible way, in particular, um, maximizing the agent's utility uh, subject to this revenue requirement or minimizing the utility loss due to the tax. So there are three critical assumptions in the Ramsey model. First, we prohibit lump sum taxation. Okay, so remember I talked about in the end of the previous lecture the distinction between the Ramsey and the Merlis approach. In the Merlisian approach, you permit whatever taxes you want to implement. In the Ramsey approach, you, uh, you eliminate lump sum taxation because if you allowed lump sum taxation, we know the answer to this problem is trivial. If you want to finance E dollars of a public good, you would just implement an E dollar lump sum tax, right? That's gonna create no distortions and be the most efficient way to raise the revenue. But that's not an interesting problem. We think that in practice, for reasons related to redistribution, which we're not modeling here, we can't, we're not actually gonna to wanna to use lump sum taxes. And so we just rule that out by assumption uh, in the Ramsey approach. Second, we assume that we cannot tax all commodities. That is, there's at least one commodity that we cannot tax. So can somebody say why this is? Why is that assumption important? So what happens if you can tax every consumption good or tax consumption and leisure? Yeah, it's equivalent to a lump sum tax, right? If you can tax everything, you don't end up distorting relative prices, right? Uh, and so as a result, there's uh, effectively, you know, you effectively have access to a lump sum tax. So one way to think about it is there's no way to tax leisure. Uh, you know, typically leisure is uh, untaxed. So that's why you're changing the relative price of consumption goods and, and leisure, say with an income tax or taxes on consumption. Uh, and so, you know, we think that this is also a reasonable assumption and is analogous to number one. The third assumption we're gonna make uh, which is not critical to the Ramsey approach, but is uh, you know, standard when analyzing these types of models, is that we assume producer prices are fixed. Okay, so constant uh, 
sorry, I infinitely elastic supply curves. So, you know, uh, producers are not going to bear uh, any of the incidence of the tax. And then just as a normalization, this is not an assumption, just normalize all the pre-tax prices to one because it, it, it's not going to affect anything. And so I'm going to denote by QI the post-tax price of good I, which is going to be one plus tau I, where tau I is the specific uh, tax on good I. Okay, so we have one individual in the Ramsey model. Uh, and so, so, you know, we have no explicit redistributive concerns, right? So I just want to be clear. Um, someone asked me a question after lecture, which is also relevant to the efficiency analysis, uh, which is why do we assume the, the way we're going to think about this problem is the individual does not internalize the effect of uh, his behavior on the government budget, which might seem like a weird assumption in the context of a model where there's only one agent. But the way we're thinking about this is that in, uh, in the broader economy, if you're thinking about your own choice of how much to consume of a good, you're not going to take the feedback effect onto the government into account, right? That, so what's the feedback effect in this model? If I change my behavior, I reduce consumption of good I because you have a higher tax on it. If I literally benefit from the public good that you are supplying, then you might think, okay, with a single person, I take that into account because there's a one-for-one -one effect on the government budget. But we're going to assume that you optimize ignoring the fact that the government budget is going to change when you change your behavior. What are we trying to capture? In an economy with a million agents, your own impact, that, you know, if you consume more candy bars, that has a trivial effect on the government budget. So to first order, you uh, ignore its impact on the government budget and take it as fixed, right? So just think of this. So we make this assumption here as we did in the efficiency analysis. We don't internalize the impact on the government budget. That's, a, that's an approximation of what would happen if you had a lot of agents, right? Any one agent has little impact on the provision of the public good. Okay, so w given that assumption, the individual maximizes his utility function over the end goods and say uh, labor L to satisfy this budget constraint. So this is his uh, expenditure on the left hand side and then total income on the right hand side where notice I don't allow a tax on L, right? Okay, so we first uh, describe how we solve, solve the individual's problem and then we'll think about the government's uh, problem. So the Lagrangian for the individual's maximization problem is standard. So this is his objective, the utility function, and then this is his budget constraint. We're going to let alpha denote the multiplier on the budget constraint. And you get the standard first order condition that you set the marginal utility of consumption of good I equal to alpha, the multiplier on the budget constraint, times QI, the price of good I. Okay, so alpha, which is equal to dv dz, the marginal utility of an extra dollar, uh, it represents the marginal value of money for the individual. All right, that's the interpretation of that multiplier uh, in the standard utility maximization problem. So that problem is going to give you demand functions xi of q comma z, so demand for each good, Marshallian demand functions, and an indirect utility function v of qz. Where Q, just to be clear, denotes the entire price vector, including the wage rate W. Right? The government uh, now solves the maximization problem max V of QZ. So the government is maximizing the agent's indirect utility. So here you see the standard setup of optimal policy problems in public finance, where you have an individual problem where the individual is choosing behavior to maximize his own utility. And then the government problem nests the individual's problem, where the government is setting the taxes to maximize the ind individual's indirect utility or value function, where the value function is a function of the choices that the individual makes, subject to some revenue requirement or some bal balanced budget constraint for the government, right? So the government's revenue requirement is just that tau dot x, the total amount of revenue it collects, has to be greater than or equal to e. Notice that in the government's revenue requirement enters the individual choices, right? The, the QIs, the XIs chosen by the individual are going to affect the amount of revenue the government generates. And that's going to be the source of the deadweight loss and the uh, inefficiency that matters for optimal taxation. Now, you can equivalently write this problem with its dual, which is to minimize the excess burden of the tax system. So you can say the government 
if you remember, just think back to our definitions of excess burden, uh, evaluated using the expenditure function for the individual minus the revenue requirement, uh, you can equivalently think of the government as trying to minimize excess burden subject to raising that same amount of revenue. And we won't do this here, but you'll see, you can show that you get exactly the same formula as if you solved that second problem instead of the first. Okay, so let's start to think about how to solve this. So first, we're just going to do it uh, algebraically, and then we'll talk about the intuition. So for the government's maximization problem, the Lagrangian is, again, given by the objective plus lambda times the constraint. Lambda now denotes the multiplier on the government budget constraint, right? So let's differentiate that with respect to QI. Equivalently, it's the same thing as differentiating with respect to tau I, the tax on good I. So what com components does that have? So you have a DB DQI. That represents the private welfare loss to the individual of raising the price of good I. Then you have this mechanical effect on revenue, which is if I raise tau I by a dollar, the mechanical revenue that I get, get is proportional to XI, the amount that the guy was spending on that good. And then you lose some revenue from the fact that when you raise the tax, there are going to be changes in behavior. And changes in behavior, not just in the consumption of that good, but consumption of all potential goods. And if you have taxes on all the goods, then that's going to affect your budget constraint through all these terms here. OK, so now to uh, go further, we're going to use Roy's identity, which tells us that the marginal uh, impact on utility of raising the price of good I is just minus alpha times xi. Okay, so how do we interpret that? Alpha is the marginal uh, value of money, right? The marginal utility of a dollar. And xi is the amount you're spending on good I. This is just an application of the envelope theorem, right? If I, if you're spending 10, if you're buying 10 units of a good and I increase the price by a dollar, your utility loss is equivalent to the marginal value of $10 to you because we don't need to worry about the fact that you're going to re-optimize your consumption because that has a second order effect, right? So the, the lost uh, value is essentially what is $10 worth to you and alpha tells you what $10 is worth to you, right? So it's alpha times the consumption of the good. The government, uh, Okay, so, so we get minus alpha xi here, right? Okay, so now we, let's combine terms. So we get a lambda xi minus alpha xi. That's the first term here. And then we get the second term that's coming from the behavioral responses. So notice that the difference between lambda and alpha measures the marginal value of a dollar to the government relative to the individual. Okay? And so what's the way to think about that? The government... Uh, might value money more than the individual if these public goods have a benefit, right? The government's actually doing something useful with the money. Notice that th we get a direct connection to the marginal excess burden formula where lambda equals alpha, right? So the way we were thinking about excess burden before, there were no benefits to the government doing any taxation. So you can just think about that as the case where lambda equals alpha and lambda equals one. Uh, and so that first term drops out and all you get is the second term which you'll recognize as being similar to the excess burden formulas. In fact, it's the same thing. It's the revenue leakage version of these formulas. That's exactly what it is. Okay, okay so then just uh, carrying through with the algebra, you can see that the optimal tax rates are going to satisfy a system of n equations and n unknowns, which look like this. Okay, they depend upon these uh, price elasticities, and then they depend upon intuitively just the relative value of money for the government relative to the individual. Okay, so now we're going to rederive that formula using a technique that I think is very useful in a lot of applications, which is a perturbation argument. It's useful to get intuition on what matters for optimal policy and what the key forces are in determining uh, optimal tax rates or optimal social insurance or any number of problems that we're going to talk about. So the idea of the perturbation argument is really simple. You say, suppose I'm at a given tax system, right? We know that if I'm at an optimum, a necessary condition is if I perturb that system by a little bit, it should have no impact on welfare. Now, that's not in general a sufficient condition. It's a, it's, a, it's a, you know, it requires concavity, right? So the, it requires global concavity. If that's uh, the case, then we know that if the first order condition is satisfied, uh, 
uh, you're at the optimum. But you know at the least that this is a necessary condition. If you can perturb the tax system by d tau i and you gain welfare, you can't possibly be at the optimum, right? Okay, so suppose the government increases tau i from some level uh, by d tau i, by some small amount. What is the effect of that tax increase on social welfare? Well, it's the, it, it, there are basically two components. There are the, there's the effect on private surplus, the utilities of the agents and the economy in this case. And there's the effect on government revenue, right? So what's the effect on government revenue? Let's start with that. So these are the terms we had before. If I raise the tax rate by uh, d tau i, I gain extra revenue through the mechanical effect of just x i times d tau i. And then I have these behavioral responses where d x j denotes the amount that I change consumption of x j when I have this perturbation. Okay, and so I'm gonna gain or lose revenue on these j goods depending upon the dxj for all of those goods. What's the marginal effect on private surplus? That let's call that du. That's given by dv dqi. So what does the guy lose when you raise uh, the tax rate by one dollar times the amount you change the tax rate d tau i on that good, right? And so what you get is. Uh, here, just again ap applying Groy's identities minus alpha i, uh, alpha x i d tau i, right? So the idea of the perturbation argument is that at the optimum, uh, this perturbation should have zero impact on total welfare. And so we, we basically, if we add the two effects and we put this weight lambda on government revenue, so that's the value of government revenue relative to individual consumption, then we have to have du plus lambda dr equals zero, which uh, exactly gets us back to the formula we had before. If you just look at the previous page, the sum of those terms is exactly what we derived just by directly differentiating that equation. Okay, so it's intuitive that you're basically setting the marginal gains from another way to think about it. If I just come back here, this is the marginal value of raising the tax in terms of uh, the wedge between lambda and alpha, that's the extra benefit you're getting from that government expenditure. And this can be thought of as the efficiency cost that you're incurring. And so you set those two equal uh, at the optimum so that they balance out. Okay, any questions on the basic setup? Yeah. Because, so the government, let's say, is taxing apples and bananas, right? Yeah. So if I change the tax on apples, it's going to make you buy uh, fewer apples, let's say if I increase it, uh, but more bananas. And so I need, to, if I, I need to look at total government revenue, right, to look at the impact on the budget. So I need to take into account the impacts on all the other markets as well. Right? Okay, so now we're going to rewrite this formula in a few ways and talk about its properties. Okay, so the first thing that people often do um, is rewrite the formula in terms of Hicksian elasticities in order to obtain further intuition into what's going on. So use the Slutsky equation, which tells you, you know, the standard thing, Marshallian demand, Hicksian demand, capturing the price effect and income effect. Substitute that into the formula that we had before. So that gives you this expression here. All we've done is changed dxj dqi to this expression here involving compensated elasticities and income effects. And then rewrite it like this. This is just a rearrangement of these terms. Uh, and you get an expression that looks like this, okay, involving the sum, the weighted sum of the Hicksian elasticities set equal to minus theta over lambda, where theta is given by this expression. Okay, so you can go through this algebra uh, on your own. Let me explain the intuition for what, the, what, what this equation shows. Okay, so theta is given by this expression here. Let's talk about what that parameter is first. Theta, first, first thing to notice is that it's independent of i. It doesn't vary across goods, okay? And what it measures is the value for the government of introducing a $1 lump sum tax. So why do we know that that value has to be positive? Anybody? So suppose I could introduce a $1 lump sum tax. I know that that has to uh, generate value for the government. Yeah, Pascal. 
Yeah, it's because you're basically relaxing a binding constraint, right? So you know, we've ruled out by assumption that the, your uh, ability to levy lump sum taxes. And we know that if you could levy lump sum taxes, you would just cut all these distortionary taxes down and levy that instead. So it has to be, that we know that there's value to relaxing that constraint on the margin. Uh, and so it has to be beneficial to allow the government to levy a $1 lump sum tax because if they could, they would just shift completely to lump sum taxes. Does that rely at all on the uh, discrepancy between lambda and alpha? Uh, yes. So you can see here that if lambda equals alpha, theta is not going to be positive, right? right. Um, It's, it's suppose I, no, 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 it's allowing you to do all the other taxes. So the way to think about it is there's another constraint which I haven't been writing down, which is that the total lump sum tax has to be less than or equal to zero, right? Okay, so there's a multiplier associated with that constraint. That multiplier is what theta is actually. So if I slacken that constraint, I'm going to re-optimize all my other tax rates and cut them down. And then I'm going to use a dollar of the lump sum tax. So suppose I say you can levy a one dollar lump sum tax instead of zero, that's going to give you benefit of theta. Yeah. Lambda could be less than one, but in that case, you would not uh, want to be raising government revenue to fund this. I mean, that would then that would take you to the corner solution of you don't want to levy any taxes. All right. So we apply the um, this formula. We get the theta. Okay. So I want to explain what the theta is. So theta, the, the expression is given by this, lambda minus alpha minus lambda times this expression here, right? Okay, so what do the three terms correspond to? They are the three effects of introducing a $1 lump sum tax. The first is that there's direct value for the government of lambda because I have a dollar more of revenue, and that's the multiplier associated with the government uh, revenue constraint. Second, there's a direct loss in welfare for the individual of alpha because that's the multiplier on his uh, budget constraint, okay? And then there's a behavioral effect, which is that there's a loss in tax revenue for the government given by this uh, expression here, the usual thing of uh, all the changes. This is just D, what's in parentheses here is just revenue, right? So this is D revenue DZ times lambda, right? Uh, and so that ends up, the government ends up losing that much in terms of revenue, and so that gets offset multiplied by lambda, okay? So the net impact of introducing a $1 lump sum tax is going to be all of these effects. One thing that you see here, which is important to keep in mind, is lump sum taxes uh, can have distortionary, can have impacts on excess burden when you have other distortionary taxes, right? Because they affect the total amount of revenue that you collect. That's what's embodied in that third term. If all those tau j's were zero, then that thing would be zero. Does that make sense? So because you're changing all the demands when you change the amount of a lump sum tax, if all those goods were already taxed, then you're going to end up changing the amount of excess burden of the tax system when you uh, levy a lump sum tax in the presence of pre-existing distortionary taxes. Okay, lump sum taxes have zero deadweight cost only when there are no other taxes in the system. Okay, so the point of writing it in this way is to get to this representation of the formula. So you can write the formula, this is just copying from the previous slide like this, okay? So this is the weighted sum of the Hicksian elasticities multiplied by the tax rates, 1 over Xi, and then this is the theta over lambda thing. The, don't worry about the right-hand side now, and we've explained what that is. Uh, the, the important thing to remember is that it does not vary with I. It's fixed across all the goods, okay? So. Uh, let's suppose now for just to build intuition that the revenue requirement E is small so that all the tax rates are relatively low. Then the tax tau J on good J is going to reduce consumption of good I holding utility constant by approximately this amount here. All right, so what, you know, what's going on? If I introduce a 1% tax on good J, then how much do I change consumption of good I holding utility constant? It's given by DHI DQJ, right? The Hicksian demand, that Hicksian cross elasticity. And so if I uh, have then, if I look at this sum, look at the numerator of the left hand side, so this summation, you can interpret that as the total reduction in the consumption of good I due to the tax system, right? So think about this with two goods like apples and oranges. 
how much do I reduce the, the consumption of apples due to the tax system? It's the tax rate on apples times the demand elasticity or the slope of the demand curve, the Hicksian demand curve for apples, plus the tax rate on oranges times the cross elasticity, the elasticity of consumption of apples with respect to the price of oranges, right? And so you can interpret this term here as the total reduction in demand for each good because I have this vector of taxes in the, in the economy. So some of these might be positive, some of these might be negative, et cetera, okay? Uh, that's not going to happen in the optimum, actually. But the point is, uh, it's just the total impact of the tax system on the consumption of each good. Now, what we see next is we divide by xi, okay, on the left-hand side. And that, that just converts the units to percentage terms. So you can interpret now the left-hand side as the percentage reduction in the consumption of good i due to the tax system. So sometimes this is called the index of discouragement of the tax system on uh, the consumption of good i. By how many percent, in a Hicksian sense, holding utility constant, do I reduce consumption of apples because I have the tax system in place? And similarly, compute that for every good. And what does the Ramsey tax formula say? It says that the indices of discouragement for all of these different goods should be equal to the same number. Okay, that's the point. The right-hand side is a fixed number. So the idea is that uh, for apples, for oranges, for whatever else, uh, whatever other goods there are in the economy, the total amount of distortion that I create in demand, taking into account all the cross effects, should be the same, which is intuitive. Yeah. Okay, so that's the intuition of the formula. You basically want to equate the efficiency cost of the tax system across all of these different goods, which makes a lot of sense intuitively. Okay, now you can look at a simple case of this, a specialized case, which gives you a very simple formula, which is widely used, which is the inverse elasticity rule. So if we just go back to the previous slide, okay, and write this in terms of elasticities. Okay, so I write uh, this as uh, epsilon cij instead of um, the slope of the demand curve. So I'm just dividing and multiplying by 1 plus tau j, right, and the quantity. Uh, then I can rewrite the formula like this. And let's now consider the special case where all the cross elasticities are zero. So when I, uh, uh, when I raise the price of good one, I don't directly affect consumption of good two aside from income effects. Okay, so of course if they're income effects, I might end up affecting consumption of the uh, other goods, but I'm looking at Hicksian elasticities here, right? So there's no direct price complementarity or substitutability across these goods. So the apples and oranges example would presumably violate that, right? Because when prices of apples go up, you might consume more oranges. So we want to think about goods that are separate. So in other words, we, we assume the Slutsky matrix is diagonal. Then you get a really simple formula, which is tau uh, i over 1 plus tau i equals theta over lambda, the thing we had on the right-hand side, divided times 1 over the elasticity. And that's the why it's called the inverse elasticity rule. You set lower tax rates on things that are that have uh, higher elasticities, right? Exactly as you'd expect uh, intuitively. Questions? Okay. So, what are some limitations of the very simple uh, Ramsey formula? So, what Ramsey tells you to do is tax inelastic goods as much as possible in order to minimize efficiency costs. But the problem with that is it doesn't take into account redistributive motives, right? So uh, you would think intuitively that necessities are likely to be less elastic than luxuries. And so you, essentially what the Ramsey formula is telling you to do is to tax necessities, right? Tax things like food or um, essential medical drugs or whatever, right? Which people, which are, you're not going to end up distorting demand if you tax those goods. Uh, but what that means then is that the optimal Ramsey tax system is likely to be regressive. That is, more of the incidence of the tax is going to fall on lower income individuals who we think consume a larger fraction of their income in necessities rather than luxuries. Almost by definition, if you define a luxury as a thing that has an income elasticity of more than one. Uh, and so you would think that the simple formula that we've derived is not really in, its, in itself relevant for thinking about optimal tax policy. You want to incorporate additional considerations. And so that's what's done in a paper by Diamond, um, who extends the Ramsey model to take redistributive motives into account. I'm not going to cover that here uh, in the interest of time. Again, I think Emmanuel Fari will cover this in the spring. It's an extension of the Ramsey model, uh, where the intuition is actually pretty simple at the end. 
you replace um, the multiplier lambda here uh, with the average marginal utility for consumers of that good. So in, in essence, instead of this term on the right-hand side being a constant, the term is going to vary depending upon who is consuming that good. And if the people who are consuming that good have higher marginal utilities, that is, they're lower-income people, you are going to end up putting, uh, you're going to end up levying lower taxes uh, at the optimum because you're, you're basically taking account of the fact that money is worth more to those guys than it is to the higher income guys. Okay, so you can see how you can uh, get that to work. The math is a bit more complicated than this, but uh, we're not going to cover that. Okay, so what I want to do next is uh, talk about an application of the Ramsey approach to the taxation of savings, and then connect it to the Shamley and Judd uh, results, the second important result in optimal taxation that I was talking about initially. So. Uh, to think about savings, think about a standard life cycle model of consumption where you are maximizing the sum of utility over time. If you want, you can have discount rates. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, subject to your lifetime budget constraint, which is that the total amount you spend across all the periods in your life has to be less than or equal to some fixed wealth endowment W. Uh, and we're going to, uh, you know, as usual, QT equals 1 plus tau T times PT, where PT are the pre-tax prices, all right? Uh, and I'm going to assume that tau 0 is fixed at 0. So this is the assumption that I said you always have to make in the Ramsey models, that one of the goods can't be taxed. Otherwise, you're in a case where effectively you have a lump sum tax, because if I can tax the goods in all the periods and I don't have leisure here, then I can, uh, it's effectively like I've just taken away some of your wealth and there's no distortion there. Okay, so the way you can see immediately that you can apply the standard Ramsey formula here, that this fits within the Ramsey framework, is that consumption in each period is isomorphic to consumption of different goods. So the fact that we have C1 to C10 for 10 different periods is no different mathematically than if I had apples, oranges, bananas, and 10 commodities, right? And so I can therefore apply the standard Ramsey formulas that we've already derived to calculate the optimal tax rates. They apply directly to this model. Now to connect that to optimal capital income taxation, think about the prices as follows. So rather than just having an arbitrary set of prices for each good, usually the way we think about it is that there's an interest rate R, okay, and then the price of good T is given by 1 over 1 plus R to the power T in the absence of taxes, right? Because the future consumption costs less in present value because I can invest the money and earn a rate of return at rate R, right? And that gets compounded over time. Now, the way we typically model capital income taxation is that we tax your interest income, okay? So there's a 1 minus theta levied on that R. And so that effectively distorts the price of consumption across periods. So now it turns out you can see very easily why the optimal capital income tax rate, that is the optimal value of theta, is going to converge to zero in the long run. That's the Shamley Judd result. Okay, so here's the simple logic. For any theta greater than zero, so that is if you have any positive capital income tax, the implied tax rate on consumption in period T approaches infinity as T goes to infinity. So the idea is that the distortions are becoming infinitely large over time. Your implicit tax rates on consumption are becoming infin infinitely large. So let's just work through that simple logic. Look at QT over PT. So go back to the previous slide. What is uh, QT over PT? By definition, it's 1 over 1 plus, it's, sorry, it's 1 plus tau, right? QT over PT, the ratio of the post-tax price to the pre-tax price is just 1 plus the tax rate. Okay, so that's fine. Now, given the way we've defined the prices with the capital income tax, that can be, that's the ratio of 1 plus R to 1 plus 1 minus theta uh, times R to the power T. So what I'm doing is take the ratio of QT to PT um, when I have QT defined in this way, and PT is going to be 1 over 1 plus R to the power T, right? PT is the pre-tax version of that if theta equals 0. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, PT equals QT 
when theta equals zero. Right? That is the free tax price. Okay, so I take that ratio and I get this quantity here. And then you can see immediately that this uh, expression as t goes to infinity is going to get infinitely large. How can you see that? Because the number in the numerator for any positive theta is bigger than the number in the um, denominator, right? So that's the wedge that I'm creating by the, by the capital tax. And then I'm exponentiating that over time to the power t so that if I go 100 years out, I've created a massive distortion in the price of consumption. And so what you can then effectively see is that if you look at it from the perspective of the tax rates that you're levying on each of these goods, your tax rates are going to infinity. So what's happening if you have a fixed capital income tax, you're effectively making the price of consumption very far fr from now, like in future periods, very high relative to its true cost. You're, you're, you have compounding distortions over time, okay? And so what that implies then, you know from the Ramsey formula that the optimal tax rate on any good cannot approach infinity, right? The, the tax rates, if you look at this as a standard consumption problem, there are going to be finite tax rates on all of these goods uh, that are uh, functions of the elasticity like we saw in the previous slides, right? And so that immediately rules out the possibility that you can have any positive theta being part of an optimal tax system. So what does that imply in a dynamic model? Uh, you still have to raise the money in some way, right? And so Shamley and Judd consider a setting where, let's say your only tax instrument is this theta. So you have no choice. You have to levy some theta in order to uh, raise revenue. So the way you would do that, if you allowed theta sub t, you allowed different tax rates over time, you would tax capital income for a while, you would collect enough money to build your bridge or do whatever you want to do to finance the government. And then you would uh, let capital income tax rates go to zero. So that's why this, is, this result is called, you know, it's, it's stated as the capital income tax rate converges to zero in the long run. Asymptotically, optimal capital income tax rates are zero. All right? Well, I mean, you can see that here, right? Because I just read u sub t. So you can write that as delta to the power t times u of, u of ct. So that, you know, that nests the case. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah. So we are looking at this from the perspective of present value uh, and with an infinitely lived agent. So there's a debate in this literature about whether you look at it from the perspective of the steady state or from the current, uh, you know, the current perspective taking a present value over future generations. I think in this particular case, it turns out that asymptotically you want to have zero capital income tax rates anyway. But you're right that there's an issue of like what is the objective function? At what point in time are you evaluating uh, the objective function? Um, okay, so the point is, uh, you know, basically this is like a strong critique of capital income taxation, right? That's the way it's been interpreted in the policy setting. That capital income taxes generate these infinitely growing distortions. If you introduce a production side, the, what you basically get is the capital stock is being suppressed. It's being distorted tremendously in the long run because of capital income taxes. And that's led many economists to argue in favor of labor income taxation or consumption taxation instead of capital income taxation, okay? So that turns out to actually be a fairly robust result, as I was kind of saying, in the pure Ramsey framework. No matter how you define the objective function, uh, you can have various variants of this, like an OLG model, et cetera, which is covered in the Bernheim handbook chapter. Uh, and you tend to get the same result because that intuition is actually really simple, right? You can see why it would apply in a wide variety of models. But it turns out that it's not robust to generalizing the model in a number of ways. Uh, so for instance, um, if you allow for progressive income taxation uh, and also allow for taxes on capital income, then it turns out that you might actually want to tax capital income in addition to taxing uh, 
uh, taxing labor income in a fully dynamic model. And this is actually the origin of what's called the new dynamic public finance literature, which Emmanuel Fari and uh, Mike Golosov, Oleg Tavinsky, Narayana Kocha Lakota, and a number of others have been contributing to recently. And so you'll hear a lot more about that. That is a basic result in that literature, what are called inverse Euler equations and various other uh, standard results in that literature. That's going to be, I think, a major focus of the spring part of the class. Another thing that it's not robust to is if you allow for credit market imperfections. So here we're just assuming that capital markets are perfect and then you can show that the optimal capital tax rate should go to zero. That turns out not to be true if people are borrowing constraint. And then another you know, more recent paper that criticizes this result is a paper by Piketty and Saez where they assume quite reasonably that first of all agents are finitely lived. Okay, so you don't have this infinitely lived uh, agent. And the other important assumption is that you have to have Essentially, in the standard Ramsey model, you have infinite bequest elasticities if uh, the agents, if you think of each agent as living for a finite number of periods. So the idea is, if um, I make, it, if I put in this capital income tax, I'm going to leave a much, much smaller bequest to people to my uh, dynasty, because the price of consumption has gone up tremendously, right? Because I'm creating this big distortion. So they have a framework where they basically cut off that channel. They have finite bequest elasticities, and then they show that you can actually get substantial uh, capital income tax rates. So there's a lot of recent work challenging the validity of this result, but it's still, I think, a basic and powerful uh, intuition that matters in thinking about uh, optimal tax policy. There's a more general issue, which I think matters for all of these models, which is whether agents are actually that forward-looking when they're making savings choices. So earlier when I was thinking about how to set up this lecture, I was going to cover the, this uh, recent empirical work and the literature on retirement savings behavior showing quite clearly that people don't seem to be anywhere near this forward looking when thinking about uh, responses to changes in interest rates or net of tax returns. That is, there's a lot of very clear evidence that people's savings decisions are highly influenced by factors other than uh, tax rates, as we're assume, assuming in this basic set setup, right? Uh, but instead, I think what I'm going to do is return to that in the context of corrective taxes at the end of the, uh, toward the end of the class, because I think that's a more natural way to think about it. So there's evidence that people are not optimizing, and in essence, they're under saving for retirement. They're sort of imposing what people sometimes call an internality on themselves. It's like an externality, but it hurts yourself because you're, you're not optimizing. Uh, and so it's natural to think about that in the context of corrective Pigouvian taxation, which we'll talk about later in the externalities part of that class. And we'll come back to this uh, topic there. Okay. So that's what I'm going to say about capital taxes and the Ramsey model for, uh, for now in this class. And then you'll talk about the variance of this later on in the spring. Okay, so now that's basically the setup. Uh, th that's what we have on optimal commodity taxation. Uh, and so just to be clear before I move on to the next topic, what, when I say optimal commodity taxation, I mean the Ramsey model. That is the model where we assume that we have linear tax instruments. It's not per se anything about commodities versus labor. As you saw, we could have labor there and have a linear tax on labor and have a Ramsey version of that. So now what we're going to do is move on to the income tax literature, which you know, mathematically the key distinction is that we take the Merleysian approach of allowing for a general set of instruments. And it's most natural to think about that in the context of income rather than commodities because it's very hard to think about how you'd levy a progressive tax on uh, like consumption of oranges or something, right? You'd have to keep track of the total number of oranges that the guy bought, which is obviously not uh, straightforward to do. Okay, so here's an outline of what the, uh, this part of the lecture will look like. So first we'll just start with the optimal static income tax problem, which is uh, the standard and very influential Murley's model. We'll then talk about how one can implement that model empirically, which is uh, most probably the work of Emmanuel Saez and then other related papers by Peter Diamond and others. We'll then Say, I'll say a little bit here about this issue of income and commodity taxation together. So that's like combining this part with the previous Ramsey part and basically showing that you don't need to use the Ramsey tools if you have the progressive income tax. That's the Atkinson and Stiglitz result. 
I'll briefly explain the intuition for that, but you'll go through that in detail in the spring. Uh, and then we'll talk about optimal transfer programs uh, like the earned income tax credit or in-kind transfers where there's another uh, model by Saez that's influential as well as other work that we'll talk about. So let's start with just some basic notation that we'll use throughout this part of the class. So let's let T of Z denote an agent's tax liability as a function of his earnings Z. Uh, and then that, there are four things that are useful to think about in that context. First is uh, the size of the transfer you get when you have zero earnings, okay, T of zero. So typically in an optimal tax system, because these people with zero earnings are going to have the highest marginal utilities, you're going to end up wanting to levy a negative tax on them. That is, you're going to want to give them a transfer of minus T0, sometimes also called a demo grant or a lump sum grant. Second, the concept of a marginal tax rate is familiar. Uh, at a given level of income Z, how much of the extra dollar do you get to keep? One minus tau T prime of Z um, measures your marginal tax rate and is relevant for intensive margin labor supply responses. What is intensive margin? How many hours you choose to work conditional on working? At the margin, what uh, matters for that choice is your marginal tax rate. What matters on the extensive margin is number three, the participation tax rate, which I'm going to call tau p, and I define that as t of z minus t of zero divided by z. Okay, so that's uh, what fraction of your earnings you get to keep when moving from zero earnings to an earnings level of z, right? And so the way you can see that is write your net of tax earnings at level Z as Z minus T of Z. That's the amount of money you get to keep, your take-home pay. Just subtract and add the T of zero, the demo grant, the lump sum. Okay, so minus T of zero here plus T of zero there. And then I can write this as minus T of zero, the transfer, uh, plus Z times one minus tau P, where tau P is defined like this, okay? And so what that shows you is that my earnings, my net of tax earnings, are given by the total amount of the transfer that I get plus the amount that I earn, my pre-tax pay, times one minus tau p. So that's why it's intuitive. That's why it's, we define tau p as the tax rate on uh, the extensive margin, okay? What it tells you is if I moved from uh, zero earnings to an earnings of z, uh, what fraction of my income gets, what fraction of my additional earnings gets taxed, right? Uh, and why is that relevant for the extensive margin? Because if I'm making that binary decision of whether to work or not, which we're going to come back to later, uh, that's what's relevant rather than the marginal tax rate at any given part of the schedule. And then the final concept that people sometimes talk about is the break-even earnings point, which is the point where T of Z star equals zero. So usually, most standard optimal tax systems will have a single break-even point. So uh, we can see that here, and th this is an illustration of the actual U.S. tax and transfer system from a uh, uh, paper by Saez in 2009. Okay, so this is for a single parent with two kids, and what he's plotting is your gross pre-tax earnings on the x-axis and your disposable earnings, that is uh, z minus t of z in our notation, on the y-axis. Okay, so first thing you can see is that there's a significant um, transfer or demograt in the U.S. Uh, because of programs like welfare and uh, the food stamps program, which we value at, uh, you know, convert it to a dollar value and add it in. You get like eight or $9,000 if you're a single parent with two kids uh, and earn nothing. And then, uh, as we've talked about, you have the EITC, which actually makes the slope of this thing, your net of tax earnings, above the 45 degree line initially. It's a subsidy for work. And then that gets cut back uh, as you start to get taxed and the EITC gets phased out. And then the break even point here is where your, uh, your earnings, your net of tax earnings, hit the 45 degree line. That is, you're paying uh, zero taxes and you're receiving zero transfers. That's at about $32,000 um, in the US. Okay, so this relates somewhat to the, you know, Romney's now famous 47% uh, number. <laughs> Who, these, these people below 33,000 are not uh, paying taxes on net, right? They're receiving transfers from the government. So that, uh, that's actually nowhere near 47%. He's also including 
uh, lots of other people who do pay taxes at some point uh, in their life. So, uh, but that is, you know, there are a significant chunk of the people who, in fact, receive money on that. What percent is below 32K? I, off the top of my head, um, Hmm. Oh, in that, yeah, yeah, I, d I don't know what that number is. My guess is that the number is, you know, below, uh, it's like on the order of 20 or something. I mean, the, the key issue, the, the reason that statistic is really misleading is because it doesn't take intertemporal considerations into account. So there are lots of people who don't pay tax at one point who start paying tax later. Or another good example is retired individuals. They paid a lot of tax. Now they're getting Social Security benefits. So to count them as people who are just living off the government seems, uh, I think, inappropriate. Um, uh, this, uh, let me I forget. So the x-axis net of payroll taxes, I forget if the disposable earnings, I think it includes payroll tax. I think it includes payroll taxes. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, you know, so the question, just to, I mean, make it clear, the question is, is this tax system optimal or some other variant of this, right? Okay, so you can see that that's a high dimensional, it's a much more complicated problem than the Ramsey problem, because in the Ramsey problem, we were basically picking the slope of a line, and now we're picking the slopes of this function throughout this space. So it's a much more high dimensional, complicated problem than the Ramsey problem. All right, so let's first start with the benchmark case, sort of the first best of uh, the case where there are no behavioral responses. So I change the tax system, and somehow I'm able to keep everybody working exactly the same amount they were uh, before I had any taxes. Okay, so here's the standard setup. We assume that there's a utility function that each agent has, which is strictly increasing and concave. Notice, importantly, that I don't allow that U of C to be indexed by the agent, like it's not U sub I of C. That is actually pretty important. So the standard uh, Merlesian setup does not allow for preference heterogeneity. So the reason that's important is because the, the only reason that one person is earning more than another is because he has higher skills. He's gonna have a higher intrinsic skill level, higher wage rate that's gonna allow him to earn more. It's not because he actually has a higher taste for consumption. You can see how that's going to generate totally different results, right? Suppose all of us have the same wage rate, but I like to consume a lot and you don't like to consume. And so you choose to work less and I choose to work a lot more. You can see that the optimal tax policy might be much less redistributive in that case than in the case where you happen to get lucky and have a high wage rate and I have a low wage rate. Okay, so that's important. Uh, homogeneous utilities. C is after tax income. It's going to be your consumption. It's a static model, right? You said consumption equals income in the standard Morley's model. What the new dynamic public finance literature does, this recent work that I was describing in the past 10 years or so, is extends the basic Morley's model to a case where you have uh, an intertemporal setting with savings. Okay, income is Z, and in this trivial baseline case, we're gonna assume is fixed for each individual, so C equals Z minus T of Z, where T of Z is the tax on Z. The government then maximizes, let's say, a utilitarian objective, okay? So I'm going to talk about the objective function in a bit of detail in a second. But assume for now that we have a utilitarian objective function, meaning we just add up everybody's utility. Okay. So then if we have a continuum of agents uh, who have different uh, income Z, and that distribution, that density is given by H of Z, then I just integrate, I just add up everybody's utilities. Uh, um, and so you know that's my total welfare in the economy, right? And I want to maximize that subject to the budget constraint that I have some revenue requirement E uh, with, uh, with the usual multiplier of lambda on that. Okay. So the Lagrangian for this problem is given by this equation here. And I think I'm missing an integral sign. So just uh, write that in. Okay, so you're maximizing the total utility of the agents and then lambda T of Z, H of Z represents the total revenue that you're collecting, adding up across all the agents. Okay, this problem can basically be solved point-wise. The way to think about it is, suppose like at every different income level, I'm setting what T of Z is, right? 
So then I essentially differentiate with respect to t of z, okay, differentiate this thing with respect to t of z, that, that particular value, the tax rate levied on individual earnings z. And so what do I get um, just working through the algebra? I get a minus u prime evaluated at that point. So what does that reflect? I'm taking a dollar away from this guy that has a marginal utility cost to him of minus u prime evaluated at his consumption level plus uh, lambda, that's the value to the government of collecting that dollar, times the number of people at that point. Okay, that's going to drop out. Okay, so at the optimum then, we want to set this equal to zero. Usual perturbation argument, right? I should be at a point where if I change the tax by a little bit, that has no net impact on my objective. And so it follows immediately that I want to set u prime of z minus t of z equal to lambda, where lambda importantly, does not vary with z, right? That lambda is a fixed number that doesn't vary across the z's. And so it follows then immediately that I want to set z minus t of z to, which is consumption, to be constant across all individuals. That is, I want to set z, okay, so now I've got to satisfy my budget constraint, right? So it then implies that I want to set z equal to the average income in the economy minus the amount that I need to collect to finance my highway or whatever I want to build. Notice that in the Murley's model, because we have endogenous taste for redistribution, even if I had E of zero, I'd still want to levy taxes, right? In the Ramsey model, the only reason you levy taxes is, is in order to finance some building. Here, if I had E of zero, I'd still want to levy taxes because I, I care about redistributing money across people. Okay, so if we ignore the E thing, I basically want to set consumption equal to the mean uh, level of income for everyone in the economy. So Z bar is just uh, the, the average income in the economy. So what does that mean? That's a 100% marginal tax rate, right? So if you earn uh, more than Z bar, I'm taking away all the money that you earn above Z bar and uh, giving it to people with lower incomes. So it's a perfect equalization of after-tax income. What's another way to say that utilitarianism with diminishing marginal utility leads to egalitarianism if you have no, uh, well, no behavioral responses. Okay, and th th that's intuitive because the guys with higher levels of income have lower marginal utilities than the guys with lower levels of income. So you're going to want to keep bringing them back together until they're equal. Right. Yeah. So I didn't understand because on the previous slide, yes. it seemed to me like you were assuming that C is going to be the same for everyone. Like C is going to be. Oh, the same sorry. Same. That's sh yeah, well. Yeah, um, no, 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 no. So I'm not assuming that, right? I mean, you are, uh, C is defined as Z minus T of Z, okay? So if you have earnings of Z and you face a tax system of T of Z, you are going to end up consuming C units. Like that is the amount of disposable income you have left. That's the amount you consume. But it could be different for everyone. Absolutely. But the result is the optimal policy is to make it the same for everyone. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's not, of course, the case of interest. So the case of interest now is to incorporate behavioral responses into that model. So what does Murley's do? Just basically add in the standard labor supply model into this framework. So the individual, so remember standard architecture of these problems, we specify the individual's problem and then we'll specify the government's problem. The individual's problem is totally standard labor supply maximize my utility function u of cl subject to my budget constraint which is that my consumption equals my gross income minus the tax that i have to pay okay so c is consumption l is labor supply w is your wage rate and t is the tax schedule now individuals are going to differ in their ability which i'm going to call w distributed with the density f of w so this is what i was saying earlier people vary in their skills their ability to generate money but they do not vary in their taste for consumption or their disutility of labor. So the government now, again, wants to maximize social welfare. It wants to maximize the sum of everyone's utility. But now we're just going to take the more general case where we don't just straight add everybody's utility. We allow for some weights, which is the standard practice in this model. We don't just integrate U of CL. We put a G on that. Okay, So we call it uh, you know, welfare weights. Uh, where the idea is 
one reason I might want to distribute money from a lower income to a higher income, sorry, higher income to lower income person is uh, diminishing marginal utility, right? That's just the curvature of the U function. But I, as a planner, could have even more redistributive taste, right? There's no uh, like ex ante reason that we have to just maximize the sum of everybody's utilities. For instance, I could have a Rawlsian uh, social welfare function where I uh, essentially put weight on only the lowest income uh, individual. That is, uh, I, by my, I could define a social welfare function where the welfare of society is given by the welfare of the least well-off person, right? Or there are any number of other variants. And the G function is a flexible way to capture the fact that you might have redistributive preferences that go above and beyond what comes out of diminishing marginal utility. Okay, so that's your objective. And then you face two constraints. The resource constraint, which is just the standard thing, Right, tax revenue has to be greater than or equal to expenditure. But now, and importantly, this is the fundamental idea of the mechanism design literature, you face a second constraint, which is that your system has to be incentive compatible. Right, your, the tax system that you levy has to be, uh, and the constraints have to be satisfied, uh, subject to the fact that the agent is optimizing. Okay, and then there are different approaches you can take to solve this problem. This is what is called in the literature the first order approach, where you define the constraints for the agents in terms of their first order conditions. And then there's a technical discussion uh, involving work by Werning and others about whether that first order approach works and in what settings it works, et cetera. But in this case, you can basically think about it as we could, we could write this constraint in two ways, right? We could say that L is chosen to maximize this function. That would be the general way to write it. Or we can say we know what the individual is going to choose in order to maximize that function, and that's what it's going to satisfy this first order condition of this problem. Right? Either way, the idea is the same. The idea is that you've got to respect the individual's choice. Okay? Questions? That's the setup of the Murley's model. Important to understand the logic of it well. Okay. So before I now talk about how we solve it and how we implement it and the whole literature that's developed around that, which is enormous, I just want to step back for a minute and make it clear that the assumption about the social welfare function is actually pretty important. And I'm not quite sure it's actually right. So the Merlesian approach is to maximize the weighted sum of utilities of ex post consumption. The only thing that matters is what everybody ends up consuming in the end. And then I'm going to aggregate that, that up in some way and call that total welfare. OK, so to see what that implies, uh, with equal weights g, let's suppose we take away that g function and we have diminishing marginal utility, then as we saw, we would equate everyone's income and everyone's consumption barring information constraints. So the, you know, the prediction of the Merlesian model is if I have equal weights g and I'm uh, integrating over uh, everybody's utility, the only reason I don't have 100% uh, marginal tax rates is that I have information constraints. It's like if I could, uh, you know, overcome these information constraints and see what everybody's type actually is, I would immediately confiscate all the money of the high types and redistribute it to the low types. And the idea is that is what would make people in society uh, happiest behind the veil of ignorance. That's what people would pick. No, no, this is with. That's why I say barring information constraints. That's what I mean. Sorry, I should have. Yeah, yeah. So one way to think about the behavioral responses is I don't have information about who the types are, right? And that's why I have. I'm forced to tax income, and then there are these behavioral responses. So we don't. So in the Merlesian model, the only reason we don't have perfect redistribution is because of behavioral responses due to the information constraints. Right? But I think if you step back and just introspect, like, is that what people would actually pick? Even if, suppose, you know, you could exactly identify, one way to think about it is, you know, what are these skills? Like, suppose there are things like, to take an extreme case, you know, someone has a disability, an identifiable disability, and somebody else, uh, you know, you can look at their IQ or something and see that they're very skilled. Is it clear that you would want to tax the high IQ guys, you know, at a very high rate, um, and completely redistribute the money to other people, I think you know, it's not obvious that people would go to that limit, even barring the uh, informational constraints. So one thing you, know, you often hear like in the popular debate is this 
idea that certain types of earnings are justified. Like if you invented something great, you're entitled to have a significant chunk of money because you sort of deserve it at some level, right? Uh, that is not reflected in this objective function, right? Because this is totally consequentialist. It just depends upon ex post uh, consumption levels. And so I think there's an important question to think about of whether maximizing total ex post utility, which is what all the stuff we're going to talk about is trying to do, is actually the right objective, right? So, yeah, so, well, I mean, I'm not totally sure. So that's what I'm going to come to that in a second. One way to think about that is that that changes G, but I'm not sure that completely gets it. So, all right, so that's an old question. It's not like, you know, it's a problem that's just come up. It dates back to a lot of work in philosophy and economics. Uh, as I was saying, there are notions of people think that there are other criteria that matter, like you should get what you deserve. Uh, Mankiw has a recent paper on this. Or the idea that equality of opportunity is what's important, not necessarily equality of ex post incomes, although that's very hard to formalize, right? We feel like every kid should have a chance to uh, do, you know, earn a certain level of income, but if there's ex post inequality, maybe that's okay. Um, the, so what I think is clear is that there's no widely applied tractable framework to think about optimal tax policy besides the Merleysian approach at the moment. And that's why we're going to spend all of our time on the Merleysian approach. What are some ways you might think about developing like a empirically tra tractable model, like I'm, all the stuff we're going to do here, uh, taking into account other considerations? So one approach is exactly what you had just said. Try to m just basically build it into the Gs. So Emmanuel Saez and uh, Stephanie Stancheva have a recent working paper that they're just writing in what they call endogenous welfare weights, where the idea is the welfare weight is not just a function of your consumption or your utility, but also a function of the tax that you're paying and maybe other attributes you know, where you could try to build in like these guys are deserving and these guys are not in some way. Or like if you're paying a lot of tax, then I start to give you more of a welfare weight so that I don't get to this limiting prediction that I want to just take all of your money away as your consumption gets really high. Um, but I mean, I think that's one interesting and promising approach, but I think there are, there are other issues that are not embodied in that. So think, for instance, about the equality of opportunity. Okay, so like a very crude way to think about it is, I don't actually care about your ex post consumption, but ex ante, as long as you had some chance to get a high level of consumption, and if it's only because you chose not to work hard that you didn't get there, then I'm totally fine with that. And I'm gonna not redistribute in that case. That would not be captured in that type of welfare function. So I think that's actually a super interesting area where I think one could make a fundamental contribution uh, because of how much influence this basic uh, assumption has on all the formulas and the applications we'll uh, discuss. Okay, so let's now go run with the Murley's model and talk about its uh, various implications. So uh, the optimal tax, as is intuitive, trades off redistribution and efficiency. So forget about the revenue requirement now. It's basically unimportant. What really this is about is what's the best way to redistribute resources from high income guys to low income guys while minimizing the excess burden of these taxes. So what you're going to get is generally a tax system that has negative taxes at the bottom, that is a transfer, and then positive taxes at the top, obviously, because you've got to pay for those transfers. Notice that one important feature of the Merleysian model is that sometimes people talk about the tax system and the transfer system. In the Merleysian model, it makes no sense to make that distinction. Taxes, transfers are just negative taxes. It's the same thing. You just solve for the optimal policy together. You don't solve for optimal taxes and optimal transfers separately. We'll talk later about models where that distinction does make sense. So Merleys derives these formulas, and it's a complicated paper um, to, to understand. The formulas for optimal taxes are a complex function of the primitives of the model uh, with only very few general results, some of which were established in the Merleys paper, some of which were established in sub subsequent work. So the first, uh, the really two general results that hold regardless of the structure of the model. So what I mean, what I mean by general results is results that just come straight out of the theory, don't require any uh, calibration of parameters, et cetera. So the first, this is what I was kind of 
uh, you know, joking about the, in the first lecture is that the, the first and probably most robust prediction is that the optimal tax rate is between 0 and 100 percent. Yeah? No, no, I just mean complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's so less complicated than, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so first result, tax rates are between a 0 and 100%, all right? So uh, less than 100% is trivial. When we can see why that would be the case. Okay, you're, you're actually, uh, you're going to get people not to work if you have tax rates of 100%, right? Greater than zero is actually not trivial. It's not, A, not trivial to establish, and it's not trivial in terms of policy. Why is it not trivial in policy? Because it rules out the EITC, for instance, which is a huge policy in the US, where we have negative tax rates, right? We're subsidizing work. And so that, the Merlesian model makes the, actually a pretty strong prediction that you should not have the EITC. And so it's interesting to think about why we do uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later on, but you know, so that's one interesting result. A second famous result, which I think is actually not that relevant. Oh, sorry, you had a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I should have been clear. This is a restriction on the marginal tax rate, right? So it says the marginal tax rate should be between zero and 100%. It doesn't say the transfer that you should never have transfers. So I can have a situation where, um, you know, I, let me just draw the bucket set. So if this is pre-tax earnings here, and this is post-tax earnings here. So I start with some big transfer, right? I give you $10,000 if you're not working. And then if this is the 45 degree line, I have a tax system like that, okay? This tax system has T prime greater than zero everywhere, right? Because every extra dollar you earn, you get taxed. But there is still a transfer. There's a lump sum transfer given to zero uh, income guys. So what the Murley's model says is that's what the optimal tax system should look like, something like that. What you should not have is a slope above the 45 degree line, which is what the EITC has. That's what it rules out. Okay, so it doesn't say, that's important clarification, it does not say we should not have transfers. In fact, it predicts large transfers. But of what's called a negative income tax, that's that first thing, not the EITC. Okay. Yeah, Josh. In order to derive this result, no. Yes, sort of I totally agree with that. That's my intuition for why people actually like the EITC. That also comes back to, you know, can you fix this with the weights? Notice that G is still only a function of consumption, right? But I think your intuition, which resonates with me as well, is uh, people actually directly get utility from giving their money to people who are working. So there's this notion that, like, I'm happy to support the working poor, but if somebody is not doing any labor, then I don't want to give that guy money. So th there, what's entering your welfare function is directly the guy's labor supply, independent of what his consumption is, right? For some reason, you actually care how much he works, uh, which is a totally different uh, welfare function. OK. Uh, the second major result from the Murley's model, which got a lot of attention but is actually not that relevant for policy, uh, is that the marginal tax rate should be zero at the top of the income distribution. So for those of you who have taken contract theory or from the basic uh, micro class, you know these results that you should have no distortion at the top in uh, mechanism design. That's exactly this result, okay? Turns out that that's only true if you have a bounded skill distribution. If you have an unbounded skill distribution, we'll talk about this in more detail, that uh, doesn't end up being valid. But you can see why this actually for a time was thought to be an important result because it suggests that you want to have very low marginal tax rates at very high incomes. Uh, you actually, you know, rather than taxing those guys at the margin at very high rates, you want to have very low rates, which is somewhat surprising. But that is not at all a, a robust result as we'll see. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Yep, yep. So a couple of things. So uh, notice that in this model, first of all, there's no distinction between wealth and income, right? So it's a static model. So first of all, in a dynamic model, that distinction actually makes sense. Like you might have built up some wealth, and then you might make a distinction between transfers that are condi con contingent on wealth versus taxes. But even there, just think of a transfer as a negative tax that's a function of wealth. The other thing, which is more general, I think, is that here we are assuming that the tax system is purely a function of your earnings. But what you see in practice is that transfers especially are, contingent, are, are a function of many things besides your income. Like we saw the single women with two kids or you know, like having a particular condition, you know, disability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those things are all just ruled out by assumption in the, in the Murley's model. Okay, so we'll talk in the next lecture about deriving these results.